Um, there's four of us taking part today, um, and I will just briefly introduce them. Dan Pearson uh, is a landscape designer, horticulturalist, writer, and gardener, um, and he lectures and broadcasts about gardening um, and garden uh, horticulture, has written several books, um, and he used to write weekly gardening columns uh, for various newspapers, including The Observer, and now he has a weekly blog, Dig Delve. And uh, over in Japan, we have Midori Shintani, who is the head gardener at Tokachi Millennium Forest. Um, after training in Kyushu, she spent some time in Sweden, um, moved back to Japan in 2004, and she's been the head gardener at Tokachi Millennium Forest since 2008. And then our chair today is Sophie Walker, uh, who is a garden designer uh, based in the UK. Uh, she was the youngest woman to design a garden at the Chelsea Flower Show uh, in 2014. And she published her book, The Japanese Garden, in 2017. And so she, uh, as well as designing and making gardens, she lectures on garden design and on Japanese gardens specifically. And I'm going to pass over to Sophie in a moment um, to chair. Uh, but just before that, this is the timeline. Um, because it's a cast of thousands today, we're uh, planning to end the main part of the discussion between the speakers uh, at one and then to carry on. Well, we'll see how we go, but we might carry on as long as 1.30 with the Q&A. So over to you, Sophie. Thanks, Jason. Um, to catch a Millennium Forest is an unusual project in the Japanese context. And I just wanted to start by commenting on a couple of its more unusual aspects before talking a little bit about the tradition of the Japanese gardener. The most noticeable, of course, is the engagement of Dan Pearson as a non-Japanese garden designer. designer. Um, now, of course, the historic gardens of Japan were made by Buddhist monks who traveled to China and returned not only with the religious teachings, but with cultural practices such as garden making, uh, which quickly merged into Shinto uh, indigenous belief that was pre-existing in Japan. But since that foreign input, very little has been contributed to the gardens from abroad. In fact, in researching my book on the gardens for Japan, of Japan, this is the only project that I included by a non-Japanese garden designer. And that says something about the scale and the significance of it. But the lack of foreign input certainly doesn't mean a lack of global interest, quite the contrary. This is a great um, cultural heritage that's been a continual point of return for thinkers and intellectuals from all disciplines. Since the early 20th century, and I'm thinking first of uh, the architect Frank Lloyd Wright, who in 1903 was really the first Westerner to engage with the gardens in his own work, and yes, he did work in Japan, but other poets, artists, mathematicians, philosophers, composers, scientists even, so Einstein, Cage, Noguchi, Richard Serra, so many have credited the Japanese garden with opening new horizons, or as Walter Gropius said, lessons in spiritual intensification. Um, Gropius wrote very excitedly from Kyoto to his friend Le Corbusier in 1954 to exclaim that everything they, the Bauhaus, had been fighting for has its parallel in old Japanese culture. He even said the Zen gardens could be works by Arp or Brancusi. In fact, as a garden designer myself, the book I wrote began as an excuse for me to spend time in Japan looking and thinking about the gardens and their wondrous ability to convey both the playful and the deeply meaningful. There really is no other living tradition like them. The Japanese garden is the longest course of garden making in world history. It's 1500 years old, invention, reinvention, and reinvention more. They frame com complex conceptual propositions with such visual clarity that we would be forgiven for mistaking the ancient for the contemporary. It's important to say that these gardens are not in the tradition of nature as the decorative or nature as the sublime. Instead, they carry with them the long and deep tradition of Buddhist philosophy, Shinto animism, and with them their associated arts and cultural practices. It's the subtle metaphoric language of the Japanese garden that's maintained its poetic enigma over centuries, and it's this that keeps us engaged in its profundity. These are gardens that offer the possibility of a passage, a threshold through which we may discover not simply an arrangement of plants and rocks, 
though of course that's what they are, but a moment of profound revelation that belongs to a metaphorical world that is both human and subjective. In spite of all the time I've spent in them and thinking about them, I'm still confounded by the question, how is it that a human scale rock can take on the stature of a great mountain? The next unusual thing to say about the Takachi Millennium Forest is its significant environmental agenda. That is to offset the carbon emissions from Mr. Hayashi's newspaper printing business, which I understand he has now offset by 120% through a mixed use of land over 400 hectares, part garden, part reforestation and part farming. In our degraded natural world, where the last remaining wildernesses are being irreversibly encroached upon, it seems clear to me that the garden is more relevant and more necessary today than ever before. The four seasons are so poignantly framed in this garden and in the garden tradition of Japan, and this allows us to reorientate ourselves to the natural order of things. In our confused and globalized world, the garden encourages us to engage in slow, progressive, subtle change, providing us with the opportunity to celebrate the process of growth and mutability while framing the truth of decay and entropy. This can only lead to a better, more respectful embrace of the natural world. So the success of Takachi Millennium Forest is important proof that the garden can and should be environmentally engaged in a genuinely impactful way. If it's possible to work at the highest level of design and to contribute environmentally, then there is no excuse not to. I firmly assert that it is our duty as garden makers, commissioners or private individuals to reclaim the garden as an ethical place. Only then will the garden return to its rightful place amongst the highest arts. And now, on the theme of ethics, I want to contemplate the role of the gardener in the Japanese tradition and to invite Midori later to tell us about her success in crafting this garden into what it is today. A wonderful Zen Buddhist nun, the Venerable Miyakyoni, said, everything you do in making a garden should be a containment of the heart. And she's quite right. The act of tending a garden is not a job. It's an occupation, a pursuit. To garden well is to garden with intuition, which is something that cannot be learned so much as gained through time, observation and wholeheartedness. It's not simply enough for the Japanese gardener to acquire the studied knowledge needed to tend plants, but to cultivate his own patience and instinct. In other words, to cultivate character. In Japan, the very act of tending a garden is a form of dedicated practice it is a practice used to cultivate compassion, humility, respect, and through this, inner growth. A well-tended garden is a shared space where nature and human intention exist not simply alongside one another, but in a very deep and real engagement with one another. So I shall conclude with a traditional story that I often think of about a training gardener who for seven years was not allowed to touch a tool. His training was simply to watch and learn. Then one day without warning, his master sent him up to the top of a very tall pine tree to prune. As he worked his way down the tree, the master remained silent, giving no instruction. Finally, when the gardener began working on the lowest branch, the master shouted, watch, so loudly that the student jumped and almost fell from the tree. In that moment, the student realized that having almost pruned the whole tree, he was in danger of celebrating his own personal success. Gardening, as I'm sure Midori will tell us, demands full consciousness to give yourself fully over into what is being done in this moment. So on that note, I'll hand back to Jason to talk to Dan and Midori. Thank you. Um, Sophie, thank you for that excellent introduction. Um, Japan is the most extraordinary place. And I went there first in 1997 and had something of an epiphany because uh, the language which I had been searching for in my garden making and gardening life um, was suddenly put into place when I visited the gardens there because it is an art form, as Sophie pointed out, um, that is uh, revered and studied carefully um, and a remarkable thing that brings a spirituality together with the opportunity to observe the natural world and to be close to it. 
So when I was asked to be part of the team to work on the Takachi Millennium Forest in 2000, um, I was very, very interested in, in partaking. So Mr. Hayashi's vision, the newspaper magnate who started the Millennium Forest in the early 90s, is a great one. As Sophie said, he has now offset his carbon footprint of the newspaper business through this park. And it has become uh, an extremely special place. I was asked to take part in the master planning of a new layer that would work alongside the layer which had already been put in by Takano Landscape Planning. And their higher vision looked at organizing the park and the spaces so it was accessible to the public and starting to explore this idea that it would be sustainable for a thousand years. And Takano approached me to introduce a garden layer to the master plan, which allowed people to touch down in a more human way at a human scale um, into an environment which was bigger than us. Um, more wonderful for being bigger than us, but often untouchable and sometimes um, difficult to fathom um, because you arrived in this very wild place and it uh, was intimidating to many people. So for me, um, it was a very interesting opportunity to visit a new part of Japan. I had only been to Honshu by that point. So in 2000, I went up and spent some time with Takano. He introduced me to the project. I met Mr. Hayashi. I started to see that uh, Hokkaido, which you see there in the very north of the island, um, is its own very separate place, was pioneered um, not much more than 100 years ago, 120 years ago. Um, it was a space, a place that was very wild until that plant point was occupied by um, a native tribe, which have now become assimilated, called the Ainu. And the pioneers who went there, went there with a pioneering, pioneering spirit. Um, it was a very wild place. They had to tame the landscape and it was logged for oak and timber and the flatlands, very rich landscape, uh, was then reconditioned for um, agriculture. So it's a very different place. It doesn't have that culture of Honshu of the mainland. Um, it has a, a new world feeling about it. And I think this is how the Millennium Forest has come out of that pioneering spirit. Mr. Hayashi's family was an early family to settle there and he still has that big vision that is unafraid of scale, unafraid of time, and able to engage with those two things in a very interesting way. So when I first went, the park, I think was only 200 hectares, it's now 400. <clears throat> and this was the plan that was shown to me, an aerial map. And you can see here the erosion of the landscape on the flatlands to the north and the west of this picture where the uh, rich agricultural land has been re, uh, taken back by farming and agriculture. That has swept away the native vegetation. And um, as it rises up into the mountains where you can see the forests there, um, on the land that was accessible, the oak had already been felled and there was second and third regeneration of forest. Mr. Hayashi wanted to arrest this um, this, uh, this impact on the landscape and to look at this large tract of land which he had acquired as being something that could be stabilized, that could be allowed to return to nature, that could become a preserve for nature and an opportunity for people to be part of that and to see the natural world as being something that was important, significant, and um, and something which we needed to preserve for the future. So this park, I feel, really is absolutely on point right now, at a point when we're having to look at our world as being a very fragile thing that we have taken from and damaged, and need to look at right now in terms of how to uh, support it, how to live more in harmony with it,
and not to impact it so heavily because this is our home um, and so far we have only taken from it. So it's an extraordinary project. And this is the landscape of the Millennium Forest with the flatlands of um, pasture and agriculture sweeping up to foothills, which have been predominantly replanted with larch for newspaper pulp. And then you can see rising up into the mountains there, the native forests, um, which on the higher slopes is un untouched. So the reforestation here looks at taking out the larch allowing the natural vegetation to replace itself. Um, and this is a slow, long process, which we're engaging with as part of the master plan. Hokkaido is very close to Russia. It is impacted by the climate of that huge continent above it. And in the end of October, the mountains will already be showing white where the frost and the snow has come in and that comes down onto the flatlands very, very early. In November, Midori will often be under snow and um, the garden will stay under snow until April when she has to wake the garden up. So a long, hard winter, which really defines what we can do there. But the cool climate of Hokkaido is very specific in that the nighttime temperatures are cool enough for us to grow a wider range of plants, which has enabled us to create a garden there that you wouldn't be able to do on the mainland with its more humid, warmer evenings. I looked for um, a purchase point when I was asked to work on this project and I explained to Mr. Hayashi at Takano that I didn't want to make a Western style garden there. I wanted to make something that felt appropriate to the place, appropriate to the culture, appropriate in terms of how we'd engage on an educational level so that people didn't feel that they were looking at something too foreign, but that there was a purchase there for them to get into um, a way of looking at an engagement with landscape. And one thing that became very clear very early on was the culture of Satoyama, which is this idea Midori will talk to you more about when she speaks in a minute, about only taking as much as you need from landscape and living in harmony with it. So this image just shows a small settlement at the foot of a small mountain with that forest rising up behind. The further away you go from the settlement, the less impact that settlement will have upon the landscape. There will be a very strict set of rules which are put in place that you only take so much out of that forest, only the things that you need on a rotational cycle so that there's always time for it to replenish itself. And for the agriculture, which is carved out of the places that are needed to grow more intensively, to be closer to the settlement and only large enough for that intensity of, um, of, uh, of, of artificial growing. Closer into the buildings, you would have much more intimate gardens, things that you would need on a day-to-day -day basis. So we've taken that principle of Satoyama um, as a way of engaging with landscape in the garden. So the garden didn't feel like we were imposing a Western star set of principles upon this uh, very wild, wonderful place. Another thing that was uh, very key is that the um, concept of nature worship in Japan is very strong. Um, people understand what that means. Um, the culture of animism, seeing um, everyday objects as having their own spirit um, and their own life force um, is also something which is quite different to the way that we see objects around us, uh, things that we live uh, around and alongside, um, but tend to ignore and not give the spiritual power to themselves. So those elements that exist already at the Millennium Forest became things that we would key into as being an important part of the way that the landscape is revealed. And when I first went to the Millennium Forest, um, Mr. Hayashi put his hand on one of these erratics, these boulders that are left behind after the glaciers retreated and explained to me how these boulders had power. Um, they had an energy that was particular to this part of uh, the mountain foothill. Um, so it became clear to me very early on that if we were to, re to, to engage with those things and allow people to feel part of them, connected to them through the journeys we took them on in the garden master plan, uh, 
we would find a very natural way of the Japanese culture engaging with this very wild place, not necessarily making a garden there that was recognizable as a garden, but allowing people into the environment through ways of seeing that were familiar to them through the gardens that they visited um, as part of their culture. So this was our garden master plan, the garden layer that existed that then came to fit in underneath Carnot's master plan, which was a much wider vision. And we looked at a series of places that allowed us to engage with landscape in an ever increasingly more intimate way. So there are walks first through woodland, um, a horse pasture along the side with the domesticity of the horses there to make you feel that man was in evidence. Uh, a landform, which I'll show you now, which brings the mountains close where the pasture had simply revealed uh, an empty flat field. And then on the left here, a series of more intimate gardens, which look much more closely at that idea of the intimate part of Satoyama being a presence in the forest. Takana had already started with the team um, to look at how the forest might be managed. And after the initial clearances, um, with the lumber having been taken out by the previous owners before Mr. Hayashi took the forest over, the pioneer forests came in, the replacements to those old ancient oak trees and the space that was left behind was taken over by rapid growing species such as birch and the sasa bamboo. The sasa bamboo being problematic in that it ran throughout the understory of the forest and um, eclipsed any regeneration of things that were slower to grow. So if you imagine it was like a carpet being rolled out and the seedling trees were choked, the vegetation on the floor was choked. Um, and what they found as a team was if you streamed the sasa once a year, um, because of the short growing season, the sasa only had time to regrow enough to refoliate but it left these windows of opportunity for the light to fall to the floor and the residual seed bank in the forest floor to start to regenerate a new layer of native vegetation. So those old seeds which had been lying there resting from the old woodland started to regenerate. And Midori has now um, taken this over and is uh, managing these woodlands very, very beautifully. She will talk to you about that more fully. But the woodlands reveal themselves as these magic places with a sequence of things which unlock at the very beginning of the season when the snow melts, um, with a series of uh, plants which are all interdependent. Early things like anemones and caltha, marsh marigolds, moving through to primulas, and then on throughout the summer with layers and layers of things as one thing supersedes the next. For me, this was an extraordinary thing to witness. And I went back over a series of about three years, um, twice a year, um, to study the vegetation. And that informed the way that I would work with the plants that we would then be able to grow in the Millennium Forest. And the way that this independence, interdependency of things in the woodland worked very naturally together, informed the way that I then wanted to use things um, in the more ornamental parts of the garden. So plants that as a Westerner, we grow as specialized things, were all just there, re-revealed through this careful maintenance of producing the sasa. So cardiocrinums, these wonderful giant lilies, perfumed lilies, um, aruncus, uh, lilies, arizimas, Aquilegias, Thylictrums, Hostas, Veratrums, all these extraordinary plants coexisting alongside each other quite naturally in that habitat underneath the canopy and protection of that native oak forest. So for me, a tremendous inspiration. When we came to the edge of the forest, which had already been started and managed, um, there was this big empty field and what Takana was finding was that people would get to the restaurant that sat on the edge of the, of the forest 
and turn around and go away again because the mountains were too far away. There was a five hectare empty field in front separating people from the mountains. So the first project that we actually did that was part of my garden master plan was to re um, uh, sculpt this empty pasture into a series of waves and landforms that echoed the mountains in the distance and brought that foothill into the foreground so that you captured the light, you captured the elements, you captured the movement in those mountains and brought them forwards to start to create a series of places that are more intimate. So imagine we've just walked through that magical forest. This is the restaurant which sits on the edge. This was previously a fat, flat piece of ground. And these ridges and furrows become these waves that invite you into the landscape. And these drops uh, are often as much as five meters between the crest and the fall. And the shapes are concave or convex. And do these extraordinary things where a con, uh, concave shape will hold the view of the mountain, a convex shape will reveal a completely different acoustic. And as you move through those places, you start to engage in a subliminal way through your senses being teased by this environment. And I believe that if you can engage people on a sensual level um, in a garden setting, that you can start to uh, allow people to recalibrate and start to see things more clearly. So by inviting people into this landscape, if you can imagine uh, this is reminding us again of those traditions, ancient ways of looking at landscape. This is Sheke, the borrowed view. By bringing that view into the foreground and then people allowing themselves to wander into that borrowed view, they then became part of it. And when you came to the edge of this landform, you found yourself on the edge of uh, the forest and an invitation across into uh, the forest over a stream into wilder places. We created a series of more intimate gardens around the farm buildings. There was already a farm there that was producing uh, a, a locally acclaimed goat's cheese. And Mr. Hashi has worked with that uh, principle of the animals being very much part of this experience. So there's a goat farm on the edge and close to the goat farm and a small cafe, garden cafe we call it, we've grown fruits and vegetables and cutting flowers uh, very closely and intimately. The fruits and vegetables are used in uh, the garden cafe and Midori goes out into the forest to harvest uh, wild forest vegetables. She goes out into this garden to grow um, plants which people wouldn't usually see growing, you know, a simple thing like a lettuce. Often people don't know what that looks like when they see it um, in a supermarket shop, but here you can see it growing alongside um, wild plants from the forest and also plants that are cultivated that can be cut um, for seed or for flower um, uh, to make uh, people's lives more uh, rich for the activity of having the opportunity to grow them closely to eat and to um, and to to make the lives richer. So here you see the goat farm in the background, very close, and Midori and her very small team of wonderful people, uh, Shintaro, her um, her assistant head gardener, um, and then uh, often just one more member of staff to help. Very small team, and then volunteers. Um, and these are the stock beds where things are trialed. We have a rose garden there, which is the most cultivated end of the spectrum. Uh, for those people that might find the forest too wild, everybody loves uh, a rose garden or a rose. Everybody knows that that is emblematic of a cultivated place. So these things are important in terms of a draw for people who might find the wilder places too wild, but this cultivated place is somewhere that feels safe and, and can contain them. But all the things are useful here. So the things that are grown here um, each have their own use. Midori makes uh, rose uh, petal syrup, uh, ice cream, um, perfumes out of the roses. Everything has its function and its use. And Midori will talk to you more shortly 
about the concept of uh, 72 seasons, which is particular to Japan. So every five days, the seasons change in their own calendar. And sure enough, if you work in a garden, as a gardener, you will see that roughly every five days, something shifts that allows you to see that particular moment in its own right. And Midori has this wonderful table that is stocked with the seasonal change, with fruits, vegetables, things from the forest, things from the garden, to allow people this very intimate opportunity to see things up close and intimately. And that uh, nature table changes throughout the year. It's a wonderful thing. And it's seen as being a very important part of the way that this place is gardened. We made an ornamental garden um, to echo the feeling of the forest in an open glade um, with a perennial planting that was originally 35,000 perennials. Now, I looked at the forest floor and was fascinated by the way that that ecology worked as a, a balanced ecosystem. And I wanted to make a garden here that looked at that principle of things being layered and interdependent. So we made a collection of um, up to 18 different mixes, which each had um, a number of components which allowed that mix to be autonomous. So there were ground cover plants that would exist in the shade of the taller things above it and seasonal variation in the garden that allowed the garden to come together over the course of the growing season and change on a weekly basis. So every five days, something different is happening in this garden to chart that seasonal change. There is a broad walk which moves through the garden and connects the forest and the landforms beyond it with the more intimate places of that cutting and vegetable garden which is just behind us in this image. And it separates the higher ground which is open and dry from the lower ground on the right which is damper and more moist and con connected to the forest. And the feeling that we wanted here was that you would walk into um, a meadow, which is an interpretation of a wild place and somewhere that would include both the Japanese plants that we'd seen in the forest floor alongside Western style cultivated plants. The idea being that the juxtaposition of the Japanese native and the Western style plant would allow people to see their, their native plants again with a fresh eye for that juxtaposition of the two growing together. So you might expect to go to a garden which has been made in a Western style, a naturalistic alien style, um, with a view to there only being Western style plants. But we wanted this to very much refer to the context of the place and for this garden to help to reveal the natural vegetation that lies in the forest around. So it was an opportunity for us to um, segue um, culturally between a wild place and a cultivated place. So an opportunity for the language of gardens to reveal um, the, the native forest and, and the vegetation and the opportunity that we have to engage with it through cultivation. I'm just going to move quite quickly now so that I can let Midori speak through the different color fields which we created within that garden, each color field being separated by a large sweep of Calamagrostis grasses. You see the grasses running through here, which allows us to change the color palette between places. So it might move from being hot pinks and reds to those yellows which we'd just seen. And those Calamagrostis allow these color changes to shift as well from week to week, so that the palette of plants within the garden is like a painting which is constantly changing. And there's a pitch that happens uh, in certain parts of summer when uh, there are moments of shun, when one plant will be doing its very particular thing, it's at its most pristine, it's most energetic, it's most perfect. And then that moment of shun from that one plant will dim and another one will come to replace it much as it does on the forest floor. So we're using those rhythms to create the change through the plants being interdependent. This would not be possible, very simply not be possible if it were not for Midori being on the ground. 
Midori um, has a wonderful eye. She's a very talented gardener and she has a very good understanding of what we are trying to do um, in terms of uh, the culture of gardening, meeting this new way of engaging with nature. And Midori and I, in a normal year, will meet once a year on site at different times to help to steer what happens within the garden. And I'm going to let Midori talk to you about that. This is Shintaro, her wonderful assistant head gardener, just beginning to cut the garden down at the end of the season. Um, when you can see the, the mountains have already shown the winter in the trees being uh, losing their leaves and the freeze will come down into the garden very quickly. And then the winter holds the garden in its grip. And this is Midori and her team spreading soot to help to break the winter before the spring appears and starts the process all over again. So the garden is this fantastic catalyst in terms of engaging with so many things, with the elements, uh, with the seasons, with the cultures, both east and west, with this long-term vision and time and the opportunity to be part of a place. So here it is, the front cover of our book, which helps to explain this wonderful journey and the book cover. And now I'm going to hand over to Midori, who will touch you down on the ground with her talk. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dan, and thank you, Sophie. Hello, everyone. Now I'd like to introduce our days at Tukachi Millennium Forest. Uh, I moved uh, from the Honshu to Hokkaido 14 years ago. And even in a part of Japan, Hokkaido has unique climate and a completely new culture to me. I met new communities of a plant, insect, and various wildlife. We share the land with all the living things in the remarkable natural environment. And we gardeners are expected to be a part of it. Tokachi Millennium Forest has a mission to connect people to nature by the garden. And we've cultivated our ethos as a gardener with our nature worship. Since ancient time, our ancestors have believed in numerous divine dwelling in every element of nature, like sky, mountain, plants and streams, stones, and a tree. And the gardening at the foot of Hidaka Mountain never been a straightforward. We realize rules of nature through the gardening. For example, we can start planting the vegetables in the garden when we hear the first cuckoos call in the forest and to tell us the frost eventually stops. Our gardener's ethos has been developed by appreciating such natural phenomena. Dan told uh, you a little about Satayama. Um, I'm keen to learn from a uh, Japanese tradition and the harmonize uh, mother culture and modern gardening. Today, I introduced two things that I've been inspired. One of them is Satoyama. So Japanese archipelago was originally covered by dense forest so our ancestors had to cut into the steep mountains to create a space for living and the agricultural site. And they also collected various food stocks and firewoods, materials for housing and farming for the forest just behind the village. It depends on the region, but the highest mountain area has often been left as sacred forest and the lowest in a mountain area uh, that our ancestors utilized has been developed beautifully as secondary forest. And this particular zone is called Satoyama. Sato means village and Yama means mountain. And the Satoyama landscape has been spread out through the Japanese archipelago, but despite the Hokkaido, because Hokkaido has a different uh, history with the uh, indigenous people Ainu and they cultivated their unique nature worship as well. Here, 
at the Tokachi Millennial Forest. We have a 270 hectares secondary forest, and we also carefully set the different level and phase of forest maintenance. Like our ancestors, we utilize some parts of the forest. In early spring, we harvest mountain vegetable, especially vigorous petisitis and Japanese knotweed to take a balance of the vegetation at the same time. When we thin the young forest, we utilize them for the plant support, uh, the materials in the kitchen garden. In autumn, when we cut back reed grasses before a heavy snow crush them, we use them for the thatching roof of our office house. And everything just returned to the earth. The recycling is one of the most important thing in our garden. Another thing that we garden with is 72 seasons. A lunar calendar was used in the ancient time, but it gradually caused differences of the position of sun and the dates on the calendar. So our ancestors divided the year into 24 periods based on Chinese calendar. Then to uh, uh, live with the more delicate changes occurred that surround us in nature, the 24 periods that were then divided into three more to create that 72 micro season calendar. Each of the 72 seasons shift about five days and the name of the season captured the moment that happened in nature. For example, today is a season of a bamboo shoot appears. And of course, our climate condition sometimes differs from the other regions and the calendar. But I really like to see a land with a wider vision in Japan as a part of uh, this Japanese archipelago. So now let's take a quick trip to our forest with this calendar. And a lot of people enjoy the Hanami Cherry Blossom Festival in Japan. Snow eventually starts melting on our land. Adonis amarensis is the first bloomer in our forest. We start sowing seeds and growing plants in greenhouse. In Hokkaido, we needed to be very careful about strong late frost at this time of the year. But tough native plants start shooting in the forest. We old gardeners feel full of joy to meet plants again and work for plants outside again. In Meadow Garden that Dan designed, uh, plants catch up later following the native plants. So we prepare for new growing season. When earthworm rise, our cherry tree is eventually in bloom. The forest floors are covered by plants. In Meadow Garden also, the plants shoot one to another. We start editing the naturalistic planting mix to support ideal balance of plant combinations. Our iris starts blooming as the calendar announces. Gardener's table is celebrating the iris moment. Plants grow rapidly at Hokkaido so the garden is filled with various textures, colors, and forms. Traditionally, we have a wisdom calling the coolness to survive Japanese hot, humid summer. We welcome our visitors with the sound of hooring, a Japanese wind chime in this forest. At the same time, in the kitchen garden, plant supports are covered by crops. Our already harvest season starts. Annual meeting with Dan is the most exciting time uh, to me and to, of course, to the garden as well. And we usually spend a few days to check the condition of each plant and discuss how we develop the garden to next phase. Dan and I 
have put emphasis on understanding each other's cultures. So sometimes we share a time together like this. This is a tea time of fukiyose. And fukiyose is an old representing the scene of uh, falling leaves and fruits and nuts that gathered at the corner by wind. I really love to the, let my gardeners uh, experience our traditional, uh, the culture and the custom uh, as much as possible uh, because I, I was trained uh, with uh, um, uh, the both of uh, the both in a like whole cultural practice and an aesthetic to learn the whole cultural practice and the aesthetic uh, by the both of the culture of the east and the west and the, those experiences they helped me to nurture the place of Tukachi Millennial Forest or Modern Garden and I'm aiming for what we do is going to become the vernacular landscape Hudo in the Japanese language at the end so this is one of the reasons that I keep trying to learn from ancestors. As the calendar says, when we find white dew on grasses, uh, we find rainbow the most in the garden at, at this season. And the grasses turned golden brown color all around at the Gachi Millennium Forest. In the forest, we collect the seeds and our late harvest season starts. The gardener's table is decorated by pumpkin and dahlias. And a day is getting shorter and shorter at this time. Insects start preparing for winter slightly earlier than our, our timing. Then our harvest table shows the autumn colors a lot. I usually have a harvest moon festival called Tsukimi with my gardeners and the student gardeners. We make miscanthus and rice dumpling arrangement and offer them to the moon and appreciate for this year's harvest together. When frost falls on the calendar, our land shortly start freezing. It's time to prepare for the long, harsh winter. We cut sesa bamboo back in the forest and then the cut pernias back in the garden. We feel the snow coming down from the top of the mountain to the garden scene. And this is a very last moment to be able to touch plants in the garden. We miss our days with the plants, so we decorate them as much as possible. And then winter always suddenly arrive at Tokachi Millennium Forest. We deeply feel relieved to finish the winter preparation shortly. When nature gives a peaceful time to both of bears and humans, the land is completely covered by snow. When deers shed their antlers in the mountains, we clean all over the house to purify and make a grass decoration called Shimenawa. We wish the having another joyful days with the plants in New Year. Mountain blizzard constantly is running through the forest, but we always see the sign of life in the forest. We all surely carry on toward the next season. And the season goes around. Through gardening with the 72 seasons, we realize ourselves living for a moment as a part of nature. And we deeply feel the happiness that our gardening merge into wild nature beyond. Thank you so much for listening. I hope you enjoyed our first time. Thank you very much, Midori. That was a really beautiful presentation, if I may say so. Um, so thank you so much to all three of you, Dan, Midori and Sophie, for a really interesting talk today.